this entire week, I was looking forward to saying that I was Brian Cox's opening act, but how many times in a career do you get to say that Brian Cox was your opening act? <laughs> so, hi everyone, my name is Dr. Shauna Pandya. I have 15 minutes, 47 slides, and a whole lot of caffeine to tell you about my work in space medicine and extreme environment medicine, so away we go. First question before we get started. Imagine that you are the crew physician and you are headed to the moon today. What do you pack with you? Now, in order to know what you bring with you, you need to understand the challenges of the spaceflight environment. And this includes a whole laundry list, everything from the increased acceleration loads of launch and landing to trusting the engineering of your spaceship to keep you safe from the extremes of the temperature, the vacuum of space, orbital debris, to trusting your life support systems to scrub the atmosphere, to altered day-night cycles, 16 sunrises and sunsets, per 24-hour period, one sunrise, one sunset, every 90 minutes on the International Space Station, to the simple things, the everyday lumps and bumps that you would face on, the, uh, on, on planet Earth. And, of course, the big thing that we all think about when we come to talking about space, that is weightlessness. Microgravity, I'm told I'm not allowed to say zero-G, so we'll stick to microgravity, not zero-G. But, <laughs> suffice to say, Every single bodily system is affected by the weightless environment, from our bones losing density, reflecting an osteoporotic state on Earth, to our muscles losing mass, to our fluids shifting upwards, to our inner ears being confused, leading to a uh, space adaptation syndrome, a nauseous state in the first few days on station, um, to the brain, the, the brain juice, the cerebral spinal fluid that bathes our spines and brains, not draining as one would expect in affecting a vision in long-duration spaceflight in select astronauts. And that's just what we know from decades of low Earth orbit. So what happens when we go beyond low Earth orbit? Well, we know from hundreds of pages of documentation from the Apollo era that lunar dust was a very significant respiratory and skin irritant. Uh, it clogged up the suit joints of the EVA or extravehicular activity spacesuits. So for anyone who ever tries to tell you they faked the moon landing, they sure put a lot of effort into it. And the surprises keep coming, and the hazards keep coming. So we know that radiation is also a very real concern. The higher up you go, the more you have to contend with. And so at the level of the International Space Station low Earth orbit, you're still relatively protected from radiation by the Van Allen belts. But the higher up you go, you have to deal with the uh, increased ionizing radiation from galactic cosmic radiation and solar particle events. Um, on the Mar Martian journey of approximately nine months, you can expect to be exposed to the equivalent of a full body CT scan every five to six days. And for those of you who are Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy fans out there, you may know that Douglas Adams quote that space is big. Space is so vastly, hugely, mind-bogglingly big that light can only travel so fast, even traveling at the speed of light, meaning that depending on the alignment of Earth and Mars, um, you can face a 6 to 46-minute round-trip communication delay. So now imagine you're the crew physician on Mars and you have to deal with a ca cardiac arrest on the red planet. You don't have time to wait for communication from Earth. And these aren't all just theoretical questions that we're posing. It's not an academic exercise. Um, when we talk about the challenges for long-duration spaceflight, we summarize them into a framework that's that we call the Ridge Framework. Radiation, isolation, confinement, distance from Earth, altered gravity, 17% of the Earth's gravity on the Moon, 38% on Mars, and everything else which falls under hostile environments. So suffice, suffice to say, if you know nothing else about space medicine, it is simply that space is trying to kill you. So, this isn't an academic exercise, as I said, because starting this decade, we are going back to the moon, starting with Lunar Gateway, humanity's first deep space space station around the moon, continue on with the Artemis missions led by NASA, the Canadian Space Agency, ESA, and their international partners, the plan to put the first woman, the first person of color, and the next man on the moon with a view towards establishing permanent lunar surface operations, extending our science, and of course, serving as a test bed for Mars. So here's the cliff notes on what it takes to get to space. Space is hard, space is expensive, and space is trying to kill us. 
So here's another question while I'm throwing them out there is, what does the International Space Station have in common with a desert habitat in the Utah desert and an underwater research facility? Well, these are all analogous in some way to spaceflight. They replicate some aspect of the spaceflight environment, which is why we call them analog environments. And in the next part of this talk, I'd like to take you through my work in extreme and analog environments, starting with altered gravity environments. So let's start with the one that everyone immediately thinks about, the Vomit Comet parabolic flight, where we can replicate periods of zero-g, sorry, weightlessness for periods of 20 seconds at a time. And so why do we do this? It's to advance science and what we call TRLs, technology readiness levels, and I apologize in advance that space is full of TLA's three-letter acronyms. And in this case, we are testing an IVA, intervehicular activity spacesuit out of Canada, to increase, to test its mobility, its fine motor movement, major motor movement, and to prove that it is space worthy. But 20 seconds, even if you replicate those periods, isn't a lot of time. So in other instances, we've used gravity offset harnesses, this time in partnership with the Canadian Space Agency and their Lunar High Bay, to test an extravehicular activity spacesuit, EVA spacesuit. I wasn't kidding about those acronyms. And in this way, we were able to test the mobility of this brand new type of spacesuit. And this is where we start with citizen science. We were talking backstage, well, how can you call yourself a citizen scientist when you've published? Because it started with an interest. And I'm very proud of this work that we've done with spacesuits, because in through our work, we've partnered with the Canadian Space Agency, and we're instrumental in testing a biomonitoring device that David Senjak wore with him to the International Space Station in 2018. Remember, when we're talking about altered gravity environments, it isn't simply microgravity, zero gravity, there it is again. It's also hypergravity. When we talk about centrifuge studies, um, we, can, uh, we can replicate the hypergravity environment. There's also water analogs. What do we learn from the world of water? So starting at the water's surface, we can run simulations with an Orion capsule in off-nominal emergency egress scenarios. That's a fancy way of saying crash landings. And we can test our IVA spacesuit and how it reacts with the water as we egress to our emergency raft. And let me tell you, pro tip, do not get water in the suit. It makes things exponentially harder. Slightly below the water surface, we can create neutral buoyancy labs. We created our first ever neutral buoyancy lab with the International Institute of Astronautical Sciences this past October. And I still have dreams of being weightless underwater, going through that airlock and simulating fixing a module outside of the International Space Station. This is the value of analog environments. We learn elsewhere in underwater dive saturation complexes how to live and work as a crew. This is a flight expedition um, of the Explorers Club, our first, our, my first aquanaut mission um, called the Neptune Mission. Remember, everything's an acronym, so Neptune was nautical experiments in physiology, technology, and underwater exploration, where we worked as a crew for five days to perform technology demonstrations, physiology experiments, psychological studies. And just down the road from Jules Undersea Lodge in the Florida Reef, Florida Keys, is the Aquarius Reef Base, um, where NASA runs its NEMO missions, the NASA Extreme Environment Mission Operations. And my favorite fact about the Aquarius Reef Base is that 60 feet underwater it takes you, the divers will know this, you have to decompress before you can egress safely. It takes you 16 hours and 47 minutes to safely egress, lest you risk a dive injury, and by contrast, from the International Space Station, from the time you hit the evacuation button and get safely to Earth while escaping in your Soyuz space capsule. It can be anywhere from three to six and a half hours, depending on how you, who you ask. So you can get to medical care more definitively, more quickly, from the International Space Station than you can from the Aquarius Reef Base. We learn a lot through Martian and lunar analogs as well. This is what we call the Mars Desert Research Station. It looks like Tatooine, but I call it real life on fake Mars. And we live and work as a crew to suit up. We go, out, to go outside, we must suit up, lest the environment kill us. Um, and we're pervy to these amazing vistas. We've also learned a lot from uh, geolog geological lessons in, uh, from the Apollo era, where we practiced um, uh, enhanced geologic tools at Cinder Lake, where the Apollo astronauts trained. And finally, operational and resource-limited environments. You don't need to go out to the middle of nowhere. You simply take the resources away. This was from a 2017 high-altitude noct noctilucent cloud campaign in high-level Alberta, where we practiced our crew resource management. And this is my own operational space medicine course, where I turn my non-medical students into a space medical MacGyver. So as we look 
towards what comes next in spaceflight? What kind of questions do we need to ask? You heard from Dr. Cyan Proctor this morning about the emergence and the power of commercial spaceflight. What about the medical aspects? My group was one of the first to publish a review on medical guidelines for suborbital spaceflight. And the good news, it's not the medical stuff that'll disqualify you. It's the psycho psychological stuff. It's the anxiety, the claustrophobia, or simply not knowing how to follow instructions. As we look towards further locales in spaceflight, what else do we need to ask? What about the psychology? What kind of psychological profile does it take to endure a three to five year mission profile on Mars? Or let's talk about the space birds and the space bees. What about reproduction and sexuality in space? I've written a whole book chapter on it, and I'll give you the one line summary is that further studies are needed. So, what kind of emerging technologies and innovations do we need to keep astronauts happy and thriving and healthy in space? I say, why don't we draw inspiration from science fiction? What if we could have an entire meal's worth of nutrition in a single pellet, like in the Jetsons? Well, one of the companies I advise, Astrius, is doing exactly that, but it's chocolate, so there's a bonus. This is Astrius, long duration, long shelf life, portable, nutritious. Remember that gravity problem I started telling you off at the beginning, telling you about at the beginning? What if we could simply bring gravity with us? Well, at Orbital Assembly, for which I'm medical director of research, we talk about bringing the gravity with us. Think of it, Space Odyssey 2001, it's simple physics. The gravity you bring with you is a product of the rate of rotation and the radius of your space station. That would solve a lot of problems when it came to fluid shifts and bone density loss. And what about skills deterioration? Um, on a long-duration journey to Mars. This is a snapshot from the virtual reality medical modules that we've created at Luxonic Technologies for the Canadian Space Agency for astronauts on long-duration spaceflight to maintain their skills. Because imagine you're a crew medical officer and the first time that you learn to put, put an IV is on Earth and the next time you're called to, to place that skill is nine months later on the red planet. Your patient would be a pincushion. So we allow, we allow astronauts to practice those medical skills. So in summary, to get to deep space, we're going to have to science the space out of this. So as we wind down here today, this week, we've been asking a lot about what's next, what's next in exploration and medicine. And some, oftentimes we've been talking about pushing the limits, going further than we have before, uncovering the unknown. But I would like to end here today with telling you about a different way of asking what's next. What about saying, what, what about coming back to the first principles? Remember in the opening video on Monday, Bertrand Picard said that our duty as explorers is to serve. In her end of day talk, Asha DeVos said, our objective as explorers is to take what we've learned and turn our eyes back to where we've been and to use that knowledge for the good of humanity. So let's ask another question as long as we're asking research questions. What benefits can space bring back to planet Earth? And this is the first ever book chapter that I wrote on medical technologies on Earth that have benefited from space. So let's go back to that case study I was just telling you about. Because I would posit that in the COVID era, with the loss of access to our traditional physical learning spaces, group learning, and simulation labs, that we're all living in an austere environment of sorts. And so I'm proud to tell you that these same medical education, virtual reality learning modules that we've used for astronauts in space, we've also brought to search and rescue physicians and paramedics for learning, assessment, and training. And the last thing I want to tell you is, I'm thrilled to be here in Azores with you. But before I came to you, I was in Poland and Ukraine working with refugees and internally displaced peoples. And coming back to the first question I asked you was, what does the International Space Station have in common with an underwater research base? I would also say, what does it have in common with a conflict zone? And they're all examples of remote, resource-limited, isolated, confined environments. And I would posit to you that a lot of the good that we're doing in space through technology and innovation and research and development can be brought back to those most in need on this planet. And there's so many brains and there's so many questions that were remaining to be explored in this room. And I look forward to solving them all with you. But it all starts with a single step. Thank you so much for your attention. Enjoy the conference.